Amen. What a privilege to be here this morning, this weekend. Thank you so much for the invitation and uh, the, uh, all of you that made time to come to the marriage retreat. I believe God that, that uh, God will help you with that and uh, that God did help you with that. And so glad to be here this morning. It is such a privilege. Job chapter 1, verse 13. I'm going to preach a message I've entitled, Surviving the Tsunami. A tsunami is an arrival or occurrence of something in overwhelming quantities or amounts. An arrival or occurrence of something in overwhelming quantities or amounts. And what I want us to do this morning is I want us to travel back in time to a land called Uz. We don't really know how long ago, but we do know that it was a real place somewhere in the east, and most scholars believe that this took place during the time of the patriarchs or around that time of the patriarchs. And there was a citizen of this land who had the respect of everyone. He was blameless, he was upright, he was a God-fearing man, and he lived a clean, upstanding life. This man had 10 children. He had fields of livestock and an abundance of land. He had a household that of servants and a substantial amount of wealth. No one could argue that this man named Job was the greatest of the men of the East. He had earned that title through years of hard work honest dealings with others. In fact, his very name would have been synonymous with integrity and godliness. And then without announcement, adversity crashed down upon him like a tsunami. Job was minding his own business one day when suddenly a distraught servant runs up to him. His livestock was stolen, his crops and his land was destroyed, his servants were killed, and as if that wasn't enough, the next piece of news is all the children died in a tragic accident. Now you may have heard this story before, but what I'd like to ask you to do this morning is to stop and contemplate this with me for a moment. Sometimes we can read through a scripture or a text and we just kind of glance over it, and we look at it as a small thing, but would you do me a favor this morning and place yourself in the shoes of Job this, this morning? Think for a minute what this would be like if it was you. If you were the one that was experiencing what Job was experiencing. Try to identify with this great man who is being crushed beneath the weight of adversity. Now I'm going to read it from the text, but I want you to read it from the perspective that you are Job, and this is happening to you. Job chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 13. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby. And the Sabians attacked and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the sky, burned up the sheep and servants, and I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, Another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels, carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you while he was still speaking. Yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert, struck the four corners of the house, it collapsed on them, and they are dead. And I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. Now stop for a minute and think about how you would respond to this situation. If this was you, 
what is going through your mind right now? I mean, this would be hard for any of us. But then as we look and we find out how exactly did Job respond, we keep reading in verse 20, at this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head, and then he fell to the ground in worship and said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all of this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. How could anyone handle such a series of grief-laden events so calmly? I mean, it is calm if you think about how we would respond. How in the world... Do Job and his wife experiencing two different enemies attacking them, the Sabians from one side and the Chaldeans from another. And it wasn't like it was a coordinated assault. It just happened at the same time. Then they experienced what is described or what could be called, what they call nowadays an act of God. They, describe, they experienced two of them, fire of, uh, falling from the heavens, a strong wind that comes from the desert, killing all of their children at once. Any one of these events would be tragic. Just any one of these events would stop most of us, would cause us to uh, uh, be filled with grief. And Job and his wife experienced all of them at once. While he was speaking, something else. While he was speaking, something else. One after the other. We're not talking about years apart. We're not talking about decades apart. We're talking about the same moment. While this one is delivering bad news, here comes another one with bad news. You could almost see him after the second one. A third servant running up going, what in the world else could possibly go wrong right now? There's no way there's something else that's going to be added. Think of the after, aftermath. This is complete bankruptcy, right? Everything they have is gone. All of their livelihood, all of their resources is gone in one fell swoop. And then Job and his wife have the most excruciating pain a parent can feel, which is the loss of a child. But they're not just losing one child. They are mourning the loss of all ten of their children at one time. They are digging ten fresh graves to bury their beloved children. Can you imagine the loneliness of those empty rooms in that quiet house? And on top of that, all of his children were partying together when they died. They were feasting. They were drinking. This was what Job feared the most, that possibly in the middle of one of these feasts that one of his children would curse God. And so what he would do is he would always go and make sacrifices after the feast, and he would make a sacrifice for each child, hoping just in case if they curse God, this sacrifice can cover them. But this time, he didn't even have a chance to make the sacrifices. And now he has to deal with not knowing if they were right with God when they died. Yet we read that in spite of all this, he worshiped God. How is this possible? How did he keep his mind and heart right in the midst of all of this? How did he keep from drowning in the sorrow and anguish of these events? How could he ward off the bitterness or ignore the potential thoughts of even suicide that might creep inside of his mind? You might be thinking to yourself, surely the worst of it is over. What more could happen? They pretty much lost everything in their lives, but it's not over. There's another wave about to strike Job and his wife as they are mourning the loss of their livelihood and their children, Job's health begins to fail. Job's body is afflicted with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. And the Bible says, then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. 
Now this seems to be the straw that broke the camel's back for Job's wife. It's interesting, we don't hear from her until this point, but this became more than she could bear. And she comes to him and she says to him in verse 9, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. I think it's very important to note that Miss Job had just been through more than any of us will probably ever be through or ever will go through in our entire lives. What we're looking at in the book of Job is a worst of all worst case scenarios. It's almost like God said, I'm going to show you something so bad that nothing you ever go through will compare to this so that you know that even in the midst of your chaos, you know where to turn to. You know that you're going to get through this. She's gone through all of this at one time not spread over a lifetime. She is being crushed under the weight of this adversity. And not only that, but while her husband still had health and strength, she had hope for a future. Right? If a man still has his health, he can at least work and build back his wealth. Right? The same man who built our original dynasty can build another one. As long as he's healthy, right? There's still hope. There's still something. Okay, look, we may have to start all over again, but at least we can start all over again. And then all of a sudden, his health starts to fail, and he can do nothing but sit in a pile of ashes and scrape himself because he's in so much pain. Let me extrapolate this a little further. Job is now sick and no servants to serve him. His wife has now become his primary caretaker. Now, being a caretaker is very difficult. You can take a lot on yourself. The pressure and the weight of their health becomes your problem. It's always on your mind. It's always a weight that you're carrying as a caretaker. I remember back in 2018 when Sarah got in her car accident, my wife Sarah got in her car accident. She, uh, it, it was a horrible accident. She couldn't walk for a number of months, and so she was going to be bedridden uh, while her body repaired and, and bones hopefully join back together. We didn't know if she was going to walk again. We didn't know a whole lot of things. But we did know that she was going to be bedridden. We were going to have to do everything for her. Uh, and as a result, they're going through all these things that I'm going to have to make sure she's taken care of. Uh, and uh, this is how you do this, sir. And this is how you do that. And they're explaining how to care for my wife. And then the person turns to me and looks at me. And, and she says to me, no matter what, Make sure you take care of yourself. And at the time, you know, I'm thinking to myself, what are you talking about? Care for myself? I'm the least of my concerns right now. I do, I've got to focus on my wife. I've got to pay attention to her. And she said, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, what are you talking about? <laughs> she said, but listen to me, if you don't take care of yourself, you will not be able to take care of her. So many times a caretaker is neglecting themselves to care for somebody else. And now Job's wife is in this place where she's not only carrying the weight of all the adversity of what she's going through, but she's now taking care of her husband. She's his primary caretaker. And on top of that, Miss Job is having to watch the man she loves suffer. You've lost your business, you've lost your income, you've lost your servants, you've lost your children. And now your husband's health is failing and you're watching him suffer and wither before your eyes. It's a horrible feeling when you realize there's nothing you can do for a loved one who's in pain. It's an incredible weight to know that they are in pain and there's nothing you can do to help them. You are absolutely helpless. So the question that I come back to is how did Job keep his head in all of this? How did he keep his heart right? Or the greater question, how did he maintain inner peace when his outer world was crumbling? 
When life pushes down on you and it begins crushing you under the weight, you find out what's inside. (laughs) What happens is life squeezes you and it squeezes out whatever's on the inside. Whatever's already in there. And with Job, we find out the source of his peace through the words that he speaks. How many of you know that our words give shape to our thoughts? They reveal the contents of our hearts. And it's important to know that in this worst case scenario, how Job survived. Through his words, we can identify what he believed about himself, what he believed about God, what he believed about his circumstances. And what I want to do this morning is I want to highlight a couple of these that I believe are critical for surviving the tsunami. The first thing is that Job grieved. I know that may not sound very special or very important, but Job's very first action was instinctive and emotional and appropriate. He began grieving his loss. The Bible says that he got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. There was a very real internal pain that was coming to the surface. Can I tell you something? You must grieve loss. If you don't grieve loss, all you're doing is kicking it down the road a little bit. You're going to have to grieve it at some time. And if you don't process your grief correctly, then it'll end up coming out at another time that is inappropriate. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, to everything there is a season. And you know what Solomon is trying to teach us is that when you are in a season, you have to respect the season that you're in. You can wish you were in another one, but this is your season. This is where you are. Identify where you are and what season you're in, and then act appropriately. He says to everything, there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck what is planted, and then verse 4, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. You have to respect the seasons of life. And the first thing Job did, grieved. He didn't shove it under the carpet. He didn't try to walk around super spiritual like everything is okay. Oh, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. He grieved the loss. I'm not talking about, you know, throwing on ashes and coming to church with black for the next four years. You know, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about taking the time to grieve what is a real loss in your life. Job grieved. But with his grief, he worshiped. He teaches us how to grieve. In his mourning and grief, he began to worship God. In other words, his grief was mingled with worship. When grief is not mingled with worship, it becomes unhealthy. Then he fell to the ground in worship. Verse 20 says, this was not just a song he sang, but he was worshiping in spirit and in truth. Listen to the words of his worship because it's laced with truth. He's not a man that's in denial. He fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. There was an honest acknowledgement of what was happening. He has been stripped of his possessions and dignity, and he is not covering it. But he is acknowledging that no matter what happens, God is worthy to be praised. We had a beloved sister in our church passed away uh, last month and she was a prayer warrior. You know, I've, I felt the loss of, a, of another prayer warrior. I'm telling you there's something so powerful about these men and women of God that they learn how to pray and they're contending. They're standing in the gap for us. And this dear lady, she was a prayer warrior. She had her closet. She would be in there. If you told her, I need you to pray for this, she was going to pray for that. 
And uh, she passed away and her brother was uh, testifying at the funeral. And he's talking about, uh, uh, you know, uh, when he got COVID and he was in the hospital, he was intubated. And so she's, uh, her name's Norma, and she was texting him, how are you doing? Uh, you know, he's intubated. He can't even, he doesn't even know he's getting a text message. You know, at the end of it, his phone's all blown up with all these messages from Norma, 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 Norma. And at the end, finally she's calling him. She hears that he woke up. So she's calling him, calling him. But guess what? He's been intubated a long time. He can't exactly speak. So he's not answering the phone. And so finally he answers it. He could barely talk. He's just, he's just like, I just need to tell her to stop calling me. I'm okay, you know. So he's, he, hello, hello, hello. <laughs> barely can answer the, hello. And she goes, oh, good. You're breathing. And then she says, remember to worship the Lord. First words out of her mouth. Oh, good, you're breathing. Remember to worship the Lord. Here's somebody who understands the importance of worship in the midst of the most difficult circumstances of life. The next thing that I see here in this story is that Job claimed God's loving sovereignty. Job claimed God's loving sovereignty. Sovereignty. In his worship, that word sovereignty means supreme power or supreme authority. That he sincerely believed and knew that the Lord who gave had every right to take away. He was sovereign. The Lord who gives is also the Lord who has every right to take away. And he stated it. In his own words to his wife, shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not accept adversity? That Job would not dare lift his clay fist towards heaven and question the potter's plan. He knew God is sovereign. God is in control. He has every right to everything in my life. But Job knew that the God of all creation was both sovereign and loving. See, you can know he's sovereign, but if you don't know that he's loving, you're going to process life all wrong. You're going to constantly be questioning him. He firmly believed that God's sovereignty was laced with his love. This is why Romans 5.5, the Apostle Paul tells us that hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. You see, for the believer, our hope comes from the revelation of God's loving sovereignty. Two things that every one of us must settle in our hearts beforehand. Before the tsunami sweeps over our life, you have to settle some things in your heart. God is sovereign and God is good. God is sovereign and God is good. You can also see that Job counted on the promise of resurrection. I've learned that it is in times of our most profound suffering that we gain the greatest revelations about ourselves and about God. Some of these revelations that Job had were unbelievable. They were prophetic. Listen to this in Job 19, verse 25. In the middle of the crushing weight of adversity, he is seeing God like he's never seen him before. He is understanding God like he's never understood him before. He is understanding himself like he never understood himself before. For I know that my Redeemer lives. And he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. Do you see these things came from his relationship with God? This is like Jesus telling Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Remember, he is living probably most likely in the time of the patriarchs. He doesn't even have an understanding of the blessing of Abraham. He never mentions it. He never talks about it. So it's likely uh, that even if Abraham was living at the same time, uh, he was across the world. There was no grasp uh, or no understanding. There's no Bible to read uh, to know that there's a Redeemer coming. Right? Man has not revealed this to Job. In the midst of his greatest suffering was coming the greatest revelation of God and of himself. I know that my Redeemer lives. Where did that come from? 
and that at last there will be a resurrection? Where did that come from? God was depositing great amounts of revelation in Job's life. His gaze was forward. He was seeing the hope of redemption and resurrection. He was believing that there was a time that all pain and death and sorrow and tears would be removed. In other words, uh, he endured today by envisioning tomorrow. He knew that this was not the end. That there was more. Even if he passed from this life to the next, there was more. Finally, Job confessed his own lack of understanding. Listen to his admission to this fact. His faith and trust in God. Job 42, he says, I know that you can do everything. And then no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. And then verse 3, therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Job's looking in retrospect. This is after God speaks to him. He's still in pain. He's still in boils. He's still suffering. He still has all the loss. But God is now speaking to him. And he is looking in retrospect. And he is confessing his inability to put it all together. In other words, he is resting his case with the righteous judge. What a relief this brings. Because there's nothing more stressful than trying to answer the whys of the tsunami. How many of you have been going through something heavy, and as if the thing heavy wasn't hard enough to go through, now you're trying to solve the riddle of, of why you're going through this. Why? And you begin tormenting your mind. You begin being filled with anxiety, and you're, you're looking this way, and you're looking that way, and you're trying to discover why this and why that. This is the greatest temptation in the midst of chaos. And I think the imagery there of Job's friends, because, you know, Job, they sat in silence for seven days. He was just, he was sitting there in misery. And then once they started speaking, they were the ones asking the questions. They were the ones making him talk and respond. Said, what kind of nonsense is this? Job didn't understand the riddle of his circumstances. And this is where faith kicks in. And believes and trusts God without explanation. We can't give or accept oversimplified answers to the complex situations that life brings us. We can't just afford platitudes and just kind of, oh, well, you know what? And we just say something and we just dismiss it like it's not a big deal. This was Job's method for maintaining peace in his heart while chaos surrounded him. That no matter what was happening on the outside, by faith he found God on the inside. He held on to God even as the waves of the confusing tsunami came crashing down over his life. On the outside there was total chaos, but on the inside there was peace. There was a blessed assurance that was on the inside. There was an anchor in his soul that was keeping him in the midst of all this chaos. God surrounds us in the midst of the tsunamis of life. And I'll tell you this, if you can find God, you can find peace. If you can find God in the midst of that chaos, you will find peace. And I believe by contrast, this is the reason why Job's life lost her, wife lost her peace is because she lost God. She says, curse God and die. This is not the statement of an evil woman. This is the utterance of a grieving and broken woman who lost God in the midst of the chaos. You lose God, you lose peace. You find God and you find peace. You drill down. You say, God, uh, there's a lot of things that I don't understand right now, but I'm holding on to you that you are a good and sovereign God, that you love me and that you are taking care of me even when I don't see it and when I don't feel it. You might be feeling the weight of the tsunami right now with the waves of this thing crashing down on your life right now. And I will tell you this, as a word of encouragement, tsunamis aren't forever. It's a season. It's a period of time. There will come a day 
when the tsunami will subside. In the midst of the tsunami, Job had this incredible encounter and visitation from God. I would encourage you to read it this week. Chapters 38 through 41, God encounters him. It's incredible. But at the end of everything, our faithful God restored Job's life. Listen to what the Bible says. Chapter 42, verse 12. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. The first daughter he named Jemima, the second Keziah, and the third Karen Hapuch. Nowhere in all the land were there found women as beautiful as Job's daughters. And their father granted them an inheritance along with their brothers. And after this, Job lived 140 years. He saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. And so Job died, an old man and full of years. You know, we generally think of this tsunami as taking up Job's entire life. I don't know, I was thinking about this when I read this. I was kind of shocked. Wait a minute, he went on to live another 140 years after this? Like, I would have, like, I almost was thinking this is his whole life. Oh my gosh, this man's life was horrible. No, there was a season that was horrible. There was a tsunami that was horrible. But that was not the end. Think about it. If he had 10 full-grown children... When the tsunami hit, that means he's at least 50 years old. <laughs> at least, right? That's a, that's a generous uh, uh, guess that he was 50 years old before this time of crisis came. And then he was very blessed those entire 50 years, right? And then the tsunami hits and everything falls apart. He goes through all of the, you know, that's why we think it's so long, the 40 chapters of, of ugh, that, 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 we, that we get to experience with him as he's going through the drama. But at the end of that, he has another 140 more years of double the blessing he had in that first 50 years. So if you just begin to put it in perspective, because that's the hard part. When you're in the midst of tsunami, you think this will never end. It'll never stop. This is the rest of my life. This is what I'm doomed for. This is just what life is going to be for me. But if you raise up your eyes and you look at the bigger perspective of this small season of his life, tragic, difficult, but a small season of his life, The blessed years far outweighed the years of the tsunami. The blessed years far outweighed the years of the tsunami. It wasn't his whole life. It was a season. But it was a season he had to get through. And how did he get through it? He got through it. Not with all the answers. But he had something settled in his heart. God is in control. God is good. And I'm going to cling to him no matter what happens. I want to ask you to bow your heads this morning. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Just for a couple of minutes as we take time to pray. I'm fully aware that I'm preaching on a subject that may only be applying currently to very few people. It's one of those messages that I believe are important for us to file away for when the tsunami hits our lives. But it's also very important that we get out in front of it and settle some things in our heart. If you're here this morning and you are visiting with us, we want to welcome you and we want to thank you for taking the time to come this morning. While every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I would like to ask you to contemplate your life And your relationship with God. Do you have a relationship with God? The Bible says that our creator God, he made us, he has a purpose for us. And the number one purpose is that we would be in relationship with him. Have a relationship with our creator. The problem is our sin. The Bible says that our sin separates us from God. And no matter how righteous we try to be, no matter how good we try to 
to be. No matter the good deeds, they will never outweigh our sin. The Bible says our righteousness is as filthy rags to the Lord. That there are none righteous, no not one. That every single one of us have the same problem of sin. And that sin is what's separating you from God. If you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with God, it's because your sin has created a barrier between you and God. He is a righteous God. He is a holy God. And your sin has to be dealt with. The price of your sin has to be paid before you can be reconciled to God. But no matter what you do, you can't reconcile it yourself. You can't pay for it yourself. You could spend your whole life trying to, and you never will be able to, and God knows that. The Bible says God so loved the world, he so loved you, that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago came, the sinless son of God, God in the flesh came and he dwelt among us. He who was without sin, he knew no sin, became sin for us. They took the precious, perfect lamb of God, sinless lamb of God, and they crucified him on, on a cross. And all of our sin was placed upon him, all the sins you've ever committed placed upon him. He was judged for your sin and for my sin, for all the sins of the world. And then this incredible invitation comes where God says, if you will believe in him, if you'll put your faith in that sacrifice, if you will believe that he was judged for you and you will take him as the sacrifice for your sins, if you will receive that by faith, then you can be saved, you can be right with God, your sins can be forgiven, and that thing that is blocking you from a relationship with God will be removed and you can know him as your personal Lord and Savior. And you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, I'm not right with God. There is sin in my life and I want to repent of my sins and I want to get right with God this morning. Would you lift up your hand where I could see it all across this place? Lift it up quickly all across this place. God is dealing with you. Just lift up your hand. Say, Pastor, that's me. I need your prayer this morning. I want to repent of my sins. I want to get my heart right with God. God bless you. Who else? God bless you. Who else? There's others this morning. God is tugging on the strings of your heart. You say, I I want to repent. I want to get right with God. I know I'm not right with God. I'm tired of acting like I can fix things. All I do is break them even more. But this morning, if you're saying Jesus Christ is that solution that I've been looking for, I've tried everything else, but I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I want to experience salvation this morning. Just lift up your hand where I could see it. All across this place, put it up and say, Pastor, would you pray for me this morning? Maybe you're backslidden in your heart at one time. You knew God, but you walked away from him. You separated yourself from him, and now you find yourself lost again in your sin, broken. God loves you. God has brought you here for such a time as this. You're backslidden. You want to get right with God. Would you lift up your hand and say, Pastor, I need your prayer this morning. God bless you. Who else? Yes, those of you that lifted your hand, maybe I saw you, maybe I didn't see you. What I want you to do is I want you to do something else. Would you get up out of your seat and would you come and meet me down here at the front? We're going to pray with you. Just get up out of your seat. Come. There's, yes, right over here, over here. There's somebody over here. I didn't see you. Just lift up your hand. Would you, you lifted up your hand. Would you come? There's others. You didn't lift your hand, but you want to get your heart right with God. Would you step out of your seat and would you come down to this altar? There's going to be somebody that will come and pray with you and lead you in a sinner's prayer. Anybody else this morning, you just make your way to the altar. Come to the front here and somebody's going to be here to pray with you. Church, I want us to take some time to pray this morning. Maybe you're not going through it right now, but you would say, God, I'm going to settle some things in my heart. I'm going to settle these things right now, right here and right now. I know that there is a huge, huge opportunity in my life. There's a a big chance that I'm going to experience a tsunami of some sorts. Just live long enough, you will. But God, I want to have things settled in my heart. I want to make sure that I settle these things. There's others. You're going through what is the hardest thing of your life. Right now you can feel like the waves are crashing down on you. Like over and over you almost feel like you're drowning. Like will I ever get my head above water so I can breathe again? Will life ever be back to normal? I will tell you this morning and encourage you. It will only last a season. 
Put your trust in God. Put your faith in God. Renew that this morning and say, God, I'm looking to you. You are the author and you are the finisher of my faith. You are the author and you are the finisher, God, and I'm trusting you this morning. Let's stand to our feet this morning. These altars are open. I want to encourage you to come. Find a place to pray as we sing this song and worship God. I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just. face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just. I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth. Because, amen, let's worship God in this place. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your faithfulness, Lord God. We love you. We worship you this morning because of who you are. Lord, you are good and faithful and true, Lord God. We give you praise and we honor you and we bless you. I'll do one more thing this morning before we dismiss. I want to, if you are going through something extremely overwhelming right now, you can you can feel the weight of something. I want to pray for you uh, this morning. You're going through something very heavy. You feel like it's not, just, it's not just that normal thing, but it is like an assault after assault. You know, the thing like a tsunami is it's just like waves just come and they come and they come and they come and it just keeps coming. And you're in one of those points in your life. You're very overwhelmed. I want you just to stand to your feet. We're going to pray together. And we're going to believe God to just affirm some things in our own hearts. I want to lead you in a prayer this morning and then we're going to pray as a congregation for you and we're going to believe God to just help you. Just lift up your hands to God. Say, Lord Jesus, I know that you are a good, sovereign, loving God. I am overwhelmed by my circumstances, but my trust is in you. I'm asking you to give me peace in my mind and in my heart, that you would help me this morning. I commit my life into your hands. I believe you will help me and bring deliverance. I trust in you, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship God. Father, we thank you. I'm asking you, Lord, that you would touch every heart, every life in this place. God, I plead the blood of Jesus upon minds and hearts. Lord, that you would move by your spirit and by your power.